Welcome back, folks. You've tuned into NTI's Japan Real Estate Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Ziv Nakajima again. Great to have you with us today. We hope you'll enjoy today's episode. This is the third episode in our deal analysis series. Up until now, we've been focusing mainly on residential properties, but this time we're actually going to be reviewing a commercial property deal. The city is Fukuoka City, which we've discussed here on the podcast a few times in the past, one of Japan's most exciting cities. Full disclosure, we're biased because this is where our head office is and where I've actually been living for the past five years or so. But it also happens to be one of the world's most livable cities, at least according to Monocle magazine, which ranked it number seven in its list back in 2016. And it also features as a very high quality of life residential destination in many other lists. Fukuoka is also Japan's startup capital, its gateway city to Southeast Asia. It enjoys very modern local governance, great tourist appeal and organic growth, meaning people are actually having a lot of babies here, which is a very rare case for Japan. So all in all, a very popular destination, which naturally makes it popular for investment as well. Prices here have gone up significantly since 2012, but it's still much lower than Tokyo and Osaka, which are Japan's most expensive and internationally renowned cities. And as a result, rental yields in Fukuoka are higher as well. Now, before we go into the details of this deal analysis, a few words about commercial properties. As we've mentioned here in the past, commercial properties are a mixed bag. On the one hand, it's easier to raise rents whenever a lease is renewed, assuming the general economy and more specifically assuming the business operating in the property are both doing well. But also at the same time, they're more volatile since when things aren't going as well, businesses tend to resize, restructure, or even close altogether, which naturally affects rent and occupancy occupancy rates. And these tend to fluctuate a lot more as a result, as far as commercial properties are concerned. If you want to enjoy the best of both worlds, it's not a bad idea to go for a mixed use property meaning a unit in a condo block that can actually be used as a residential or a business office. And this also alleviates the concern of significant wear and tear, which you get a lot of with shops, restaurants, bars, and so forth. Properties that are used as offices suffer more wear and tear than straight out residential properties, but not nearly as much as commercial properties that have a lot of walk-in traffic, let alone kitchens, uh, food preparation facilities, and so forth. So this is the type of property we're going to be reviewing today. It's a 33 square meters mixed use commercial property that's currently being leased out as an office to an international trading company located on the fourth floor of a seven floor building in Hakata, which is Fukuoka City's central business district, and only five minutes walk to Hakata Station, which is the city's main transport hub. So this is where the city's train system, subway system, and national bullet train system all converge. Also where the central bus depot is. So very central, very desirable location, unlikely to ever have tenant issues. And the fact that the unit can be used for either commercial or residential purposes, again, further inflates our potential tenant base. The building is a little bit old, built in 1980, which is actually one year prior to the latest earthquake resistant building standards, which were introduced here in 1981 for reinforced concrete blocks such as this one. Two large renovations were conducted as recently as 2013 and 14, and these included the exterior walls, which were repaired, renovated and re-strengthened, as well as painted, of course and also the installation of a new elevator system, which is another big ticket item that is required every 20 years or so. So really, aside from the roof, which has not been done and will most likely need to be re-waterproofed sometime over the next five or 10 years, all of the major factors which may cause building fees to go up or may require owners to put down one-off payments for have already been done in the recent past, which obviously reduces the risk factor inherent in the older build year. The tenant, as mentioned, international trading company, which has been in residence for the better part of the last four years. No late payments or any other issues. And they've also taken out rent insurance, which if you'll recall from our episode discussing tenant securities is the best type of security we could ask for since it covers up to three months of delinquent rental payments or other losses caused by the tenant. The tenancy lease in this case also specifies that the tenant is obliged to pay for the cleaning of the property 
if and when they vacate it. So that also slightly reduces the expense risk factor in that case. The size of the unit also attractive, high return units in this area, which is highly populated and normally quite short on building space, are usually much smaller, anywhere from 12 to 20 square meters on average. This one is 33 square meters, as mentioned, and generating great returns, which is very rare. So let's break down those returns and look at the actual numbers. The purchase price for this unit was 5.9 million Japanese yen. That's just over 54,000 US dollars at today's rates. Purchase costs were another 13.25% on top of that. And that included 4.34% for the Realtors fee, just under 2% for legal and registration fees, a purchase tax bill of about 2.6% of the purchase price, and our own fee as the buyer's agent and local rep here in Japan, which if you recall is something that foreigners who don't live in Japan and don't have a physical presence here normally would require. And this brought the total price, including costs, up to about 61,400 US dollars. Now the gross monthly rental income for this property was 60,000 Japanese yen. That's about 552 US dollars per month. From that, we deduct the property manager's monthly fee, which in this case is 5% plus tax, can be a little bit cheaper if we negotiate with other property managers. Total of about 30 US dollars. Our own portfolio management fee, which is about 12 US dollars per month for this property. Landlord's insurance, which is really a joke in Japan, only about $3 per month. And the most significant portion of income deductions, the building management and reserve fund fees which add up to about 77 US dollars. Now that all leaves us with a pre-tax net monthly income of approximately 430 US dollars on our total 61,400 purchase price, or in annual net pre-tax return terms, about 8.4% net pre-tax per year. Now this doesn't include annual taxes because it's pre-tax and depending on your other Japanese income streams can take you down another half to 1.5% or so. And it also doesn't include any unknowns such as maintenance, repairs or vacancy costs, which typically could come up to about 10% income loss per year or so. So we can assume a worst case pure net income of around 6.5% to 7% return on investment annually. Excellent deal for a super central property in one of Japan's most popular up and coming cities. Add to that the fact that between 2012 to 2016, again, as we've mentioned here, similar property profiles in Fukuoka have been rising at about 25% per year. And you've got some very nice bonus profit potential there, but we don't like to bank on speculative estimates and the actual cash in hand rental income was more than enough for a client to green light the deal, which they have. Now, we've been fortunate enough with this tenant who's still leasing the property today. So going on four years, as mentioned, but if and when they do vacate the premises, the location and size of the unit, again, all but guarantees that a new tenant would be easily and quickly located. The only caveats to the deal were, once more, the relatively older age of the building and the fact that the reserve fund pool was quite low on funds at the time of purchase, just about 53,000 US dollars left in the reserve fund pool after the most recent renovations. But the relatively small size of the building, which only has 24 units all up, in addition to the substantial renovation and maintenance history, helps mitigate this risk. Client's been very satisfied with this purchase as of this date. Okay, that's about it from us today. This hopefully gives you a better idea again of what's achievable in this exciting market that we work in. Do feel free to comment with any questions you may have or just tell us what you thought about this episode or about the podcast generally. If you've got a moment, we'd really appreciate if you could leave us a rating in the iTunes store, the Google Play store, or wherever you may have found this podcast. And of course, do feel free to share it with your social networks or anyone who may find it interesting. We hope to have you again with us next week. And until then, from all of us here at NTI, we wish you happy investing. <laughs>